Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Everyone has something to say. If you operate on a human premise, this is perfectly acceptable, admirable, even a thing to be encouraged. It is the empty fuel that makes dead things look alive and entertaining distraction that makes emptiness feel meaningful. Not so in Scripture. In the wilderness of God's scroll, there is only one voice, one source of life, one pedagogy set forth in letters divinely inscribed. Make that your premise, and it will silence all the voices in the room, beginning with yours. Unlike the false consolation of many voices, it will take you to lonely places where that one needful voice can be heard more clearly. When that painful voice becomes your premise, when you truly have nothing to say, then finally you can teach scripture. Then, like the preacher in Jerusalem, you will find yourself exclaiming, All is vanity. Everything is vanity. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 435 of the Bible as Literature podcast. From the age of 10, I have wanted to be a priest. I used to walk to Vespers on my own every week to read the services. I had them memorized. From the time I was a teenager, people told me, you shouldn't be a priest there's no money in the priesthood. Why would you want to be a priest? Everyone had an opinion about why it was a bad idea to become a priest. Once I got ordained, nobody wanted me to start a mission. At least the people that I knew thought it was a bad idea. People closest to me, they were afraid I would experience pain and suffering and disappointment. Ironically, it's always the people closest to you that cause pain, suffering, and disappointment in the ministry. All along the way, there are obstacles and there are reasons to lower your expectations, but the burden of teaching demands that you raise your expectations of yourself and of the people around you. And then, as we've been hearing here in the Gospel of Luke, and of course all throughout Matthew and Mark, but explicitly in Luke... The priest himself isn't allowed to speak as a teacher. So it seems that this whole business of priestly ministry is about being told, you can't do anything, you can't speak, nobody cares, shut up and go home. And that's true if you're serious about the gospel. And the more serious you are about the gospel, the louder that opposition becomes. The greater the disappointment becomes. But I have good news. That is no reason to lower your expectations. What everyone wants is for you to join them in accepting mediocrity and lower expectations. 
Because when you do that, then the burden of the gospel is alleviated. Then mediocrity is embraced and elevated and coddled. Then the pressure is released for you and everyone else. The word isn't preached, and you can go on doing whatever it is human beings want to do unto oblivion and to no purpose. So then why have expectations if you're being canceled? The question in Luke needs to be put squarely back on the shoulders of Zacharias. In whom do you place your trust? What is the expectation all about? And that's where we find ourselves now, very early in the Gospel of Luke, understanding what the high expectations of priestly ministry are and why we are in this and why it is worth fighting for this to the bitter end. When I hear this dialogue, Father, between Gabriel and Zacharias, it reminds me of a book I was reading recently. Actually, I read it through twice in a row. It's called The War of Art, and it's about anyone who wants to create anything, whether it's a great sculpture, novel, or a new plumbing supply business. Bassam Tarazi and what he talks about a lot, about just getting things done and about focusing on that thing and how to move those distractions away from us. Because the distractions themselves are not something that have power. It's when those distractions resonate with the part of us that doesn't want to do the thing, that thinks that it's hard, that thinks it's going to come to nothing. We're afraid that we don't know what it's going to come to. Gabriel comes to Zacharias, who's already obedient and righteous, and says to him, your wife's going to conceive. And what does Zacharias do? He throws up resistance. Well, how can that be? Is that really going to happen? And for me, this is a voice that I recognize, because when I think I want to write a book, there's a voice inside of me that says, how can this be? What can happen? Now, I won't say it's the angel Gabriel who gave me the idea for the book. However, whatever force came to me that said it's time to write a book on Hosea, on Joel, it's time to write a paper on Hosea, whatever it is, that's what part of me always says is, how is this going to be? And if I talk to most people around me at work and stuff like that, they're like, whew, I could never do that. And that sounds very attractive to me because like, who am I to think I could do that when everyone around me can't conceive of doing something like that? These are the insidious voices that are around us all the time, but we can't blame them. We can only look at that insidious voice inside of us that when it hears the voice of Gabriel in the book of Luke, and we see the resistance that Zechariah puts up is something that I relate to and I understand. I know that voice. And what Luke does with that voice of resistance shuts it down. That voice is not allowed to speak. So when we face what comes of teaching the gospel, which is inevitable disappointment, inevitable sadness because we see that others don't show any interest in this and we have to keep fighting on and have to keep fighting on because that voice of resistance cannot be allowed a word that is the word of the evil one that is the word of satan that is the word that speaks against this word that says this word does not need to be taught in the Gospel of Matthew, the whole struggle that Jesus had with Satan, because Satan wanted him to be a king rather than be a teacher. And he would have been an excellent king, I'm sure. I mean, look what he was able to do when he was just a teacher. <laughs> Imagine if he had more resources, right? That's how we always speak. He would have been an excellent king. But he would have had to give in to the voice of Satan in order to do so. The voice that says, how can this be? It has to be shut down and replaced by the words of Gabriel, who announces the gospel. It's the gospel, not the resistance. And the gospel has to set your expectations, and the gospel's expectations are in the heavens. We already heard from the beginning of the New Testament where our expectations belong. Be perfect 
as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is where we have to set our sights, and that, that is where the lips of Zacharias belong, consuming and regurgitating the words that proceed not from his human heart, as Matthew already taught us, but from the heavens by the mouth of the angel. And that's why we can't lower our expectations, and that's why there's no time to worry about all of the people around us that want us to lower our expectations, that impersonate Satan as the detractor, the crabs that want to pull us back down into the water so that they don't have to deal with the very thing Zacharias is trying to ignore. The voice of the Lord crying out to us from the wilderness with the words of hope. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Right out of the gate, the good news is that Joseph is not his father, and you know of whom I speak, and that Mary's bitterness is non-functional here because the seed isn't going to come from the line of David through Joseph. It's going to come from our Heavenly Father, referenced first in the Gospel of Matthew, through the preaching of the angel Gabriel. Jesus would have been an excellent king. However, both, as you said, in Matthew and here, God circumvents the king. I definitely prefer the King James translation that the house of David, which is the language that's used all throughout the Old Testament to talk about the dynasty. He found someone from the dynasty of David and went around him. People assume that this pericope is about Mary, about her becoming pregnant, but it's about the one who was engaged to someone from the house of David. This is what's important. The gospel has to come from outside. The first mention we talked about before is John the Baptist is going to be born And he's not going to preach from inside the temple. He's going to go out to the wilderness. And the word is not going to come from the house of David. It's going to come directly from God and from a virgin. And a virgin means that there is no chance that this child came from someone else. This is what I was talking about in Hosea. Beginning of Hosea, marry a wife of harlotry. When you marry a wife of harlotry, the problem is if she gets pregnant, you don't know who the father is. This is the opposite. We have a woman who has known no other man, so therefore the only father must be God. It cannot be that the seed comes from the house of David. It is not a word of earthly power. It is not a word of the city. And if Matthew wasn't clear enough about that, Luke makes it doubly strong by adding on here. This word must be preached, but it has to come from outside. This is not a word of success. This is not a word of an earthly fortress that is protected and produced slickly with great marketing. This is about the word that must go out no matter what. No matter what. And it can't pay attention to what the politics of the city want or what the feelings of the house of David might be about because they have a lot of influence. They have very loud voices. They have very good marketing teams and they can drown out the gospel in minutes. So it has to leave. It has to circumvent. It has to come from outside because it has to stand on its own two feet, dependent on nobody and ready to fight against those very voices that one's relatives and their dark suggestions would pull that crab back into the bucket. This word has to go out on its own. It cannot depend on others. It can't even depend on the people that agree with it. It has to be independent. It has to be its own word. It's a lonely word coming from a lonely place with no ancestors and no relatives. That's why there's hope 
only in the words of Scripture. That's why it is Scripture that sets the expectation. That's why we have no right not to hope. We have no right to lower our expectations. We have no right to listen to any voice that pulls us in any direction other than the direction the words of Scripture are pulling us. And in verse 28, we hear, And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. Why would Mary be perplexed? It's interesting that she's confused, Richard. Up until now, we don't know who she is in the story other than her name means bitter. We don't know much about her from previous Gospels. So anyone who would say anything about Mary at this juncture is theologizing. If you take this as narrative, you should be as perplexed as the character because the first thing you've ever heard about her is that she's as confused as we are about her and about the situation. In fact, you know more about her situation than she does. It's very interesting. We should all be puzzled. Why is this woman being singled out by the angel? And why does her name mean bitterness? Yes, of course we're perplexed. We should be perplexed. If we think we understand what's going on at this point, it's because we're reading something else into this. Favored is the word that the text uses, but it's hikaritomeni, from Hades. She is seen through grace. She is given grace. Grace is being bestowed upon her. Greatly favored already. I don't like the King James translation there, because already favored, it sounds like, you know, you're my favorite one or something like that. No, it means I come to give you grace. And she's like, what? What? I don't. Of course, it, the correct response to grace is, what, I don't understand, what? That's the correct response to grace. If your response to grace is, well, of course, God is gracious, you're misunderstanding the point. The point is, what, what, I don't, what? That is how we are supposed to respond. And this is how she responds. So, just like Zechariah was like, well, I don't understand, how is this going to happen and her, she's just perplexed. She's like, I, I don't understand what's going on. Just simply, I don't, I don't understand. This is the correct response, like you and I were talking. What is that force that makes the chick bang at that shell the first time? What is it that makes that blade of grass come out of the seed that first time? I don't know. Is it grace? Is it nature? I don't know. One moment it was not there, the next moment it was there. One moment she was simply getting ready to get married to somebody from the line of David. Very good marriage, probably, actually. And now all of a sudden an angel comes and says, you know, I'm giving you grace. That's where she's at right now. Does this mean she's holy? Does this mean, no, no, no. No, it means she hasn't had sex with another person, so she can't be pregnant from somebody else. And an angel showed up. That's all we know. That's kind of crazy, and it should be kind of crazy. If we take this as sane and as if it makes sense, we're not reading, we're assuming we're reading in. You know, Rich, even this word perplex, this translation is debatable because the word can also imply agitation or something that's troubling, being troubled. So it has in one sense, that connotation of a Roman household, when the patrician, the paterfamilias, comes to you and offers you a charis and is putting pressure on you also. So she's uncomfortable. It's not good news. It's difficult for us because, exactly as you said, we think when someone important comes to speak to us that it's entitlement and it reflects positively on us. But in a Roman setting, it's disconcerting when someone important comes to speak to you because it implies accountability, it implies there's going to be something expected of you, it could imply judgment. 
So it's confusion, but also agitation, discomfort. It's a bit disturbing that this is going on. You don't want the king or the patrician to look upon you. You'd rather be left alone. And again, I don't want to overemphasize the meaning of the name Mary, but I think it's significant. And it's a name that appears functionally, it's assigned to more than one character in the story, but functionally, it's a persistent function throughout the narrative when it's associated with a woman and a community. It's important that it means bitter. So there's something going on here that should be disquieting and uncomfortable for the church because the priest was just canceled and now we're dealing with the community. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. There it is, that word again, of course, Hadis. And your point about the translation is excellent, Richard. At the same time, there's a value to the translation, favor, because it de-theologizes the word grace. It strips it of its Roman context, but so does the theologizing about grace that you hear in churches every Sunday. What's nice about the word favor is that it captures one aspect of the Roman context, that somebody important with authority is by fiat approaching you and showing favor towards you. This is something very difficult in an American setting to understand because you immediately poo-poo this as favoritism. Well, guess what? Scripture hinges on what you dismiss as favoritism. And without favoritism, there's no hope for you entering the kingdom because if we simply assess your if we simply assess your suitability for the kingdom based on merit there's no hope for you so if god doesn't decide to play favorites you're out that's why your ethics and your morality and your committees and your policies are useless in scripture How many times have we said this? It's good news, and you shouldn't be afraid. And you're right, bitter one. It is confusing that you found favor with God, but you found favor with God, so just chill. You know, the church often equates itself with Mary as the one that receives the word or gives birth to the word and that sort of thing. They like that piece of it. But I never, ever hear anyone in the church saying, why us? Why was the gospel given to us? Why are we the ones who are reading this gospel? Why wasn't it given to somebody else? Why wasn't I born something else? Why did I ever encounter this word? Why was this word ever spoken to me? Who am I to receive this word? No one ever says that. This is the correct response to grace. It is a grace that the gospel was given to the church. But when people turn that around and say, the church wrote the scripture and therefore what gives grace to the world— The church doesn't give grace because the church isn't the father of the household. God is the father of the household. He is the only one capable of giving grace because he's the only one with power in this situation. Like, you can't show grace if you don't have power. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Is a kid supposed to say, oh, I'll show my mother grace and clean my room because she told me? No, you just don't want to get punished. Like, that's not, you're not showing any grace. It's because you're going to get in trouble if you don't. That's not grace. Grace can only be given from a senior to a junior. And when the church starts to think that it's distributing grace, they've usurped the power of God. The grace that we know about from church is precisely this. When the angel Gabriel comes to speak to Mary, this is grace. This is what grace looks like. It's confusing and it's difficult. And at the same time, I mean, grace is completely based in arbitrariness like you said too father i was talking to my friends in kiev and with relatives in kiev and there was a missile attack and my friend said yeah we heard the missiles going overhead and we're lucky we survived and on the right bank they said oh yeah we're good it was on the left bank (laughs) so why did one family end up on the right bank and one on the left bank why did it strike on the left bank and not on the right bank god only knows god only knows look I'm on this side of the grass today. That is the grace I receive today. 
why did I receive this grace and not the guy that was killed on the highway this last week? Why is that? The correct response is to be puzzled. I don't know. But the angel Gabriel says, fear not. The correct response, when I see that I've received whatever grace to live, to hear this word, to teach this word, is not to be afraid, but go out and do the work that it pushes me to do. And that's to preach and to teach and to write when the resistance comes up and to sit down at my desk with my pen and write, to show up at my microphone and to record and to just keep doing the work. And that's all that I can do and not be afraid. The obsession that institutionalized Americans, which is what Americans are, which is why you'll never solve the problem of mass shootings because you are trying to create grace. You are trying to be the arbiters of love and community, and it is never going to work. The problem that institutional Americans have with love is tied to their desire to manage fairness and favoritism. It's all interconnected. We've talked about this for years on the podcast. Love is arbitrary Love is a gift. Love is a kind of favoritism. You want to control who loves you, which is why in your fake communities, your institutions, you want to control and equally distribute love and grace. That is what you mean by fairness. And that is why you complain about favoritism. I'm not talking about civil rights. This isn't related to identity politics. This is something deeper. What I'm talking about is the inability to love because of entitlement, which is universal. It cuts across all fake imaginary claims on identity. Identity is a construct. We are unable to love each other in community because we view love as an entitlement that we want to regulate, control, and manage. And scripture is repeatedly saying that God is the source of life. He is the source of grace. He is the one who loves us. We can't love him. And he loves and dispenses grace by fiat. It can't be controlled. And he loves the unlovable He loves the people that we think should be cast aside. And the story is set up so that you would be disgusted if you're paying attention to the story with the people he favors ultimately. But it's a trap because in the end, you are the disgusting person that he favors for no reason whatsoever. And then you want to complain about fairness and favoritism. This word grace is a big deal because God is coming to you, my friend, with an offer you can't refuse. He is saying to you that I am offering you the gift of my words. It's a free gift. It is given to you free of charge with a charge that I loved you the unlovable. Now, go love the people whom you find unlovable. That is the hope. That is the duty of the priest Zacharias. That is the duty of Mary in the story. And it is the duty of everyone hearing this podcast who has ears to hear, who accepts the proposition of the teaching of the Gospel of Luke. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.